Thanks, everyone. Um, so this might not be the most uh, well-attended session of the last five days, but um, this is the most important one, at least I believe so, um, and I'm somewhat biased uh, being one of the presenters today. Um, yeah, it, I mean, very good company with some of the other organizations. IBM and Lego are, are two uh, very cherished organizations for me personally, um, and so I'm very, very glad to be up here sharing the stage with you all. Um, the, um, what I'm going to present um, over the next 10 minutes or so is based on a paper which was um, put up yesterday. Um, so if you're interested in, in what I'm going to be talking about, then there's a lot more detail behind this. Um, and it comes to my role as uh, the head of AI at Fidelity. We're a pensions and investments company. Um, and um, one of the first questions that I had to look at uh, when I joined the firm, um, when we, we surveyed all of the, um, the um, algorithmic models across the organization, and, um, and then I realized I had a problem, a personal problem, which is I had to maybe make some ethical choices on behalf of the firm. And I certainly didn't feel um, very well qualified or very well equipped to do that. Um, and so what we looked at was, was not doing what, um, what some of the other organizations which Anna has looked at did and just come out with some, some quite generic vanilla uh, statements. Um, what we tried to do is actually develop a structure of governance um, that, uh, that we could use um, to, to make sure that uh, there was a bit of top down and bottom up. Um, and, and what we were coming out with was really truly representative of the organization and our stakeholders and also very practical in scenario. So just saying AI is to be fair, we, we felt it was kind of meaningless. Um, we, we needed to look at actually the, the actual applications of, of, of AI. Um, and um, and so, um, so it's, it's, it's that framework that I want to talk a little bit about uh, over the next few minutes. Um, most of the time I have to kind of explain what digital ethics is, and, and I kind of don't need to uh, with you guys because um, Max Tegmark did a really good job of it um, on Monday evening. Um, does, I, I write a little bit for Forbes, and uh, one of the things that they say to you um, uh, when you do so is um, you, you've got to stick to your lane, which basically means as a, as a Forbes writer, I, I can't write about kind of biochemistry or um, economics or something that's outside of my field. And um, I, uh, I, Max isn't here, but uh, I think sometimes that Max as an astrophysicist should stick to his lane um, because this is an astrophysicist's view of what um, ethics is. It's like that's the entire set of everything that's possible. And then there's this little bit of, of, of stuff which we, we shouldn't be doing. And that's, um, that's ethics. Well, I'm sorry, Max, you're wrong, um, because it's not, it's not always that, um, that, that simple. Um, and um, the reason is, 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 is more likely to look a little bit like this. Um, and in, in, in my view, personal view, it, this, is, this is probably what the world looks like. Um, but actually, the world maybe is even a little bit more complicated than this um, as well. And this is what I would call my, my, my tennis ball principle of ethics, um, is that you know, any kind of ethics question looks a little bit like a tennis ball mid-flight. Um, and I'd, I'd like you to bear that in mind, but I don't want to talk about um, ethics as tennis because that will be a really poor ana analogy. Um, so you know, here we've got Djokovic and Venus Williams, um, but this is kind of how we think about ethics in the, in the West. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Do you know what I... I have, a, I have an excuse. I, I, I think I may have changed my clip up mid-presentation. Uh, mid okay, sorry, apologies. Um, you, you're paying attention, which is good. Um, so the problem in the West is that we do think of ethics as being a little bit like a game of tennis, and this is the kind of uh, the kind of uh, you know, aggression kind of model of, of 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 thinking. Is that you know I think only in the West would we have created computers which are binary, you know, zero or one, uh, black or white, this or that. Um, maybe in other cultures we would have we would have maybe thought about things differently, but very much in the West, this is how we think: it's good or bad, or right or wrong. Um, but that's actually not really a, a very good metaphor for um, for ethics. Ethics is really, in my view, um, and this is something we read about in the paper, is an activity, um, an activity of something called intersubjectivity, which I won't go into. Um, but essentially, um, intersubjectivity is about uh, the, the relationship between uh, the conversation, the, act, the activity between two people. Um, and in this case, um, um, there's actually three conversations going on when, when you're having an ethics conversation. There's obviously the conversation between the two individuals, um, but there's also an internal conversation um, within each individual. So there's three conversations. And actually the one that we need to focus on when we talk about ethics is the one in the middle. So you need to put the tennis rackets uh, down and, um, and just focus on the intersubjective space. Um, and so the nature of that is, is something where how you govern that, how you govern conversations is obviously very different as an exercise to how you govern regulatory compliance or how you govern risk and safety. And the point I would like to make, which uh, may be controversial to some people here, is that most of the things that you've heard so far are just simply not ethics. 
Um, they are things which are risk and safety uh, questions or things which are uh, better um, placed in a, in a regulatory regime. Um, and actually, that's the first point of, of the paper that we make is actually organizations must um, separate out the domains of ethics. If you've got any chance of getting this right, um, and if there's only one thing you take away from this presentation, please it's that. understand there are three very separate domains. I won't go into kind of the philosophy about this, but essentially, you know, we're, we're trying to say, you know, there are different domains, they all do very different things. Ethics is, is about intersubjectivity and it needs to be handled separately. Um, and this is all about creating a, a structure as an organization in order to enable conversations. Quite often the, the question I get asked is what is digital ethics versus ethics? You know, ethics has been this thing that we've talked about for 5,000 plus years. Um, and for me, digital ethics and ethics are going to have no difference other than it's a question of scale. Um, digital technology um, has impact. It, it, any technology is a form of leverage. Digital technology has an impact on a, an incredible scale, on a global scale, an instantaneous scale. And somehow we need to manage ethics conversations with the same scale. And that's the difficulty we have with, 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 with ethics. And so 5,000 years of philosophy now are kind of acutely uh, relevant in this modern world with technology that can have um, all the impact. The thing that we looked at, um, and we, we haven't done a paper like, like uh, as detailed as Anna's on, on, the, on the substance of, of ethics principles, but what we looked at was um, actually the structures that organizations use to govern ethics. Um, and one of the things we found um, is actually there's two broadly, there's two um, types of, of structure that you will read about. If you read Microsoft ethics principles or you know, even Facebook, um, you know, big surprise, um, you'll see that there's these ideas of ethics boards and ethics councils come up time and time again. But what we found is actually there's very little consistency between the usages of those terms. So um, what one organization might call an ethics board, another organization will call an ethics council. And we actually, we, uh, we, we looked at this um, and, and actually found a third way, which is um, a sort of champion type model, which is more distributed across the organization. Um, and based on the analysis that essentially there's two things you need to factor in, how, how widely distributed have you engaged across the organization and how integrated is ethics into your strategic um, uh, thinking, um, then there's, there's four possibilities. Um, and it, w the point we make in the paper is that um, it shouldn't matter which you pick as long as you're very deliberate about why you've picked one. And maybe we can be as an industry a little bit more consistent with our labeling. Um, the danger of not getting this right is, um, is, is, is you do something where your, your management of ethics is disingenuous to what you're trying to do. And, and I call this the tobacco industry of the 1950s approach. Um, which is unfortunately exactly what the tech industry is doing today. So, um, you know, they are very well aware of the impact on society and they are meeting behind closed doors and at the same time giving a very different message in terms of their marketing. And so um, I think, you know, we need to learn from that and learn from the history um, and think about how we as organizations want to manage our ethics and also manage that um, in, in a very um, a genuine way um, in terms of how we represent our brand and how we represent conversations with stakeholders, because I'm saying this is what ethics is all about. And then thirdly, you know, I think to my great surprise, the conversation over lunch uh, discovered that actually um, there's more than, than just us thinking about this. Obviously, in the, in the finance industry, um, you know, what we do is we, we look at organizations and we're interested in how their um, financial performance is going to change over time. Um, so one of the interesting things, apart from just doing this because it's the right thing to do, um, is looking at actually um, the impact of getting ethics wrong. And the impact of getting ethics wrong is reputational damage. Um, and if you look at Facebook as another, ex as a, uh, to use them again as an example, um, when Cambridge Analytica, when that scandal hit, it hit their share price by 15%. Now, I'm not sure that the investment community was really um, prepared for that. And so really the imperative for the investment community to understand ethics is actually to understand the quality of the governance around ethics so we can be better prepared in, in terms of um, uh, potential reputational issues coming down. And actually the investment industry has, has solved this problem um, to some extent um, and it's, this has suddenly become a thing in the last few years is around something called ESG, environmental, societal and governance, um, which um, probably because of and uh, and linked to the kind of raising of awareness of sustainability issues around the environment has become a, a really big industry in itself. And so the investment industry essentially rates organizations based on how good the governance is around their environmental policies. 
Um, and we score organizations. So Fidelity will have a score on IBM, on Microsoft, on Google, for example, in terms of environmental sustainability. It's not something we, 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 we publish, but there are other organizations that publish these scores. And essentially, it gives us a proxy by which we can then measure the quality of governance um, of those organizations. And we believe actually the same um, thing might be possible for, for digital ethics, essentially applying the same thinking, the same methodology um, to ethics. And I think this is really interesting because um, ethics is the most subjective conversation we could possibly have. You, know, you and I could argue about which brands of, of uh, cars we like to drive or which black brands of clothes we like to wear. We probably wouldn't fall out. But if we talk about ethics, uh, we're probably going to start to get into a conversation where we might really violently disagree. And actually having a conversation, which two companies, how does their ethics compare, is kind of meaningless in the same way as to say, um, what is what is a better logo, Facebook or, or Twitter? I mean, it's a kind of a meaningless conversation. But what you can look at is the quality of the governance, and that's something you can measure. If you can measure it, you can manage it. And essentially, that's the point that we make in our paper. Um, so again, the link to the paper is on the, on the screen, and we're creating a working group for um, other organizations who want to join in, in setting a, I won't say a standard, but a, a common framework for this. And uh, the working group uh, details is on the, on the screen as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, you have clearly thought uh, a lot about that because um, it took some time to, to research and, and, and compare. Um, so and in a way, you're also coming from financial industry where there was a lot of pressure after, after scandals after 2009, um, both on the regulatory and, and more on a soft uh, uh, nudging into, into ethical behavior. Um, if you take a normal industry, shall I say, well, I guess you can't really call any industry a normal industry, but if you have an average industry that hasn't necessarily come out of the recent scandals or is not regulated to the level of financial industry, where would you say um, a company should start? What is the best way to, or what is one of the ways maybe the, to, to, to kickstart this discussion? Yeah, so I've, I've had the benefit of speaking to a lot of regulators over the last few um, last few years as we've been looking at this. And I think you're right, the financial industry is acutely aware of, of the impact of, of, of getting things wrong. Um, and, and actually, a large part of the financial crisis was a failure in risk management. Um, it was also a failure in regulation, and it was also a failure of personal morality of some of the individuals involved, which is an ethics question. Um, and I think one of the big changes I've seen over, over my career in financial services, I've, I've kind of a little bit pre-crisis and mostly post-crisis, is that before the crisis, Essentially, there was two types of people in, in any financial organization, mostly back in banks, this is certainly true. Um, there's people who made money, and then there's people in compliance to mop up the damage that was done by people making money. Um, and now in 2020, and this has been a slow and steady continuous improvement over the last um, uh, decade or so, is that everyone in a financial services organization now recognizes their job is, is also to manage compliance. We're all compliance managers. It's not so much a them and us culture as it, as it was. And I think that's something which every organization um, uh, every every industry could learn from. Um, but I think speaking to regulators, I think one of the interesting thing is that regulators don't want to get too prescriptive and they don't want to overreach. And I was talking to the British um, Connected Autonomous Vehicles um, uh, um, uh, regulatory body, the CCAV, um, and, and, and their two objectives are kind of mutually exclusive. Um, on the one hand, they want to make sure Britain is... Uh, the, the Center for Inward Investment post-Brexit for the automotive autonomous industry, which obviously is, is one of the things that's going to drive jobs and capital growth in, in the UK, which we will need after Friday. Um, and the second thing is they want to protect uh, the, the public and protect consumers. And those two things are kind of mutually exclusive um, because to protect the public absolutely, you would just ban this stuff and you, and you would let all the other companies countries make the mistakes and then you would be a slow adopter. Um, so the CCAV um, have, have, are very proud of themselves because they've, they say they're the first, um, Britain is the first country in the world to have regulation on, on autonomous vehicles. But if you actually look at the regulation, it just says that autonomous vehicles need to be insured, which is kind of no great contribution to the world. Um, so, um, so they have a really difficult job. And actually, I think what we're doing here, this sort of model, is actually something that really helps them. Um, because um, if we can create a model um, for automotive manufacturers to see how good the quality of the governance is, um, and so you as a consumer can then buy a Tesla or a Toyota, 
and say, well, I'm, I'm making this choice based on how good these organizations have managed the ethics, not on the principles, but on the quality of the, of the, of the, of the governance, um, then you can be more confident in which is, which is a better organization. And the regulator can then just look at managing the marketplace and making sure the marketplace is fair. And I believe that's a really good way of the investment industry and regulation and then industry and consumers working together to solve societal aims. So long answer, I'm sorry, but it's, uh, it's I think this is kind of the answer to this across industry. Great, thank you so much, Charles. Thank you.